Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Wedding Photo Podcast. I am your host, Ulysses Del Toro. Uh, thanks again for joining me. Uh, if you guys want to reach out to me, you can find me on Instagram at Wedding Photo Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Del Toro Photo. And you can join our Facebook group. All the links will be in the show notes below. Uh, the Facebook group is great if you have any questions. Uh, that has to do with photography, wedding photography, cameras. Um, we have a growing community there, uh, and everyone is super awesome, willing to help you out and uh, answer your questions. You can ask questions that you want answered on the podcast, or if you want to just reach out to me directly, you can reach me on Instagram or Twitter. Um, thank you guys for your continuous support of the podcast. If you guys want to support the podcast, you can. Um, all I ask is that you leave a five star rating. You leave me a review, uh, let everyone know how great the podcast is, tell your friends about the podcast, uh, that way we can continue to grow uh, our community. Um, I've also partnered up with Narrative Publisher. If you guys don't know what Narrative Publisher is, they are a desktop app that you use to create blogs more efficiently. Um, it's super easy to use. Uh, I've, I've already talked about it. It takes me maybe like 30 to 45 minutes to uh, produce a wedding um, blog. Ever since I started using Narrative, it's just become more easier, more efficient. Um, all last year, I didn't blog at all because it felt like it took too much time and we just we just got kind of lazy and didn't feel like doing it because we didn't feel like sitting down and spending the time to put the blogs together. And now I'm putting out two, three blogs a week. It's been really awesome. I think pretty soon here, I'm going to make a little video tutorial of one of the, of me putting together a blog on the app. Um, I think that'd be pretty, there's not like a lot of tutorials out there that I've seen for narrative publisher. So I think I'm going to make one myself. Uh, so you guys can check it out. But if you want to try publisher, you can try it for free. And if you want to use the link in the show notes, you can actually get 15% uh, off by using code Del Toro Photo and using the link below. Um, I've got nothing new to update you guys with this week as far as things that are happening. Uh, this coming weekend will be our first wedding of the year. We got back-to-back -back wedding weekends, so we are looking forward to that. Um, I guess I'm, you know, one of the things I am looking forward to as well is um, right now I, I use two... Um, off-camera flashes when we shoot weddings uh, one on my camera uh, one on a stand um, but I don't have any wireless triggers for them I use the the infrared on the flashes to sync them and it's been great I get really great results I, I love what we're able to do at our receptions but the downside has been that I can't get too far away with the flashes and if there's too many things in the way like if there's if there's too many people in the way sometimes the flashes don't read um, and if I want to do anything creative with the two flashes where I want to try to hide one uh, that's always uh, that's always a that's another problem I've had as well where I can't get the two flashes to go off uh, so that's been kind of a pain. So I've been talking to Eric McFarlane and Steve Van Elk um, about their flash systems because I'm I'm finally going to invest in a couple um, new flashes with wireless triggers inside them so I can start doing some of the more creative stuff that I've been wanting to do. So I'm really looking forward uh, to getting those flashes. I'm going to order those this week um, once I finalize that purchase and order them. I'll talk more about the, the actual ones, the actual flashes and triggers that I got and um, maybe start putting out some examples of, of what I'm doing with those flashes. I've been thinking about these flashes for a while. I just haven't, I just haven't bit the bullet because, you know, I have my flashes. They've always kind of worked for me, but you know, uh, this is the beginning of a new wedding season and I kind of want to have something to focus on, to try something new, to be more creative. So this is going to be kind of my starting point um, to to do something that I haven't done. Uh, but that's really it. I just we, we got our weddings coming up. We're really excited to get things going. Um, we've been putting out blogs like crazy, getting tons of inquiries, you know, put, putting a lot of effort into our marketing and, and it's been doing us really good. We've been picking up some more weddings for this year and we started booking for next year. So things are looking really good. Um, if you guys have any questions on the things that, that we've been doing to market, just shoot me a DM or, or send us a message on um, the Facebook group and uh, we can talk 
talk about it. All right, I have a very special guest on today's episode. Um, I was really excited to talk to this person. This is the second half of the Wedding Photo Hangover podcast. Um, I have Dustin McKibben on, and I invited him on because Dustin has um, several different businesses that he runs uh, aside from wedding photography. He also runs a company where they do commercial video and photography, um, and he also does uh, real estate video and photography. And I wanted to have him on to talk about that because, you know, I think a lot of us when we're thinking about making the jump and going into freelance or you just want to add, um, you want to supplement your income with, with some more stuff related to what you already know, which is, you know, usually photography and sometimes videography, um, you want to know how you can expand uh, your business in that way. Um, obviously, I had a lot of interest in that because that's what we've been doing ourselves. Um, so I wanted to have him on to talk about um, how he started his other businesses, how he started his other businesses and what he's done to market them and what he's used, you know, equipment wise and just have him give us some insight on the path he took to grow these businesses. Um, he's been very successful at it. Uh, he's been doing it for a really long time. So I thought he'd be the perfect person to talk to. And he was. I really enjoyed my time talking with him. I loved having him on the podcast. So without any further ado, I present to you Dustin McKibben. Ben, how are you? I am well. And yourself? Doing good. Long time no uh, no see, no talk. Unlike Stephen, I don't seem to have a California wedding every other month. <laughs> you got anything? Uh, you got any any weddings like travels planned out? We have a lot of travel this year. Uh, unfortunately, all of it is pretty eastern. Where are you headed to? Uh, we do have one in Arkansas. Uh, we have one in Mexico, which is probably the closest to you. And that's not even that close to you. Um, <laughs> it's like three hours away. What part of Mexico, though? Riviera Maya. I don't know where that is. <laughs> Me either. Me either. I'm somewhere near Cancun, I think. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Do you guys make like a little vacation out of that when you when you do stuff like that? That one we will, yeah. Should I, but before we get rocking, do you want me to record my audio for you, or you sound you actually sound pretty good, man. I'll I'll just use uh, what I'm getting uh, over on my okay. end. Yeah, your mic sounds good. That's fine. Yeah, as it should. <laughs> um, but no, uh, for this particular one uh, in Mexico, it's kind of an odd one. Uh, it's my wife's best friend, and um. We knew we would be shooting it, and uh, we just assumed we'd go a few days early and have a good time. And then, um, and then she's like, "Yeah, we we turns out we thought we'd have more guests, and how like a lot of these venues work, the more guests that come, yeah, the cheaper the price point becomes that they charge the couple for certain things. They get like perks and uh, advantages, yeah, and um." So they're having less guests, which means the wedding's overall more expensive, which means they uh, can't pay us as much, they yeah. are telling us. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. What's Come new back. with you, man? <laughs> uh, not What's a whole... Ulysses del Toro. Not a whole lot right now, man. Uh, we haven't had any weddings for a while. We don't have our first wedding for like another two weeks, first wedding of the year. Wow. So we've just been hanging out, trying to see our family, Marie and I just you know, sometimes we don't even really know what to do with our weekends. It's been, it's been nice to have that as a problem. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I bet. Um, I'm uh, anxious to have that as a problem here coming up. <laughs> how's the, how's the season treating you? Are you guys like busy right now or is it slowing yeah, down? Yes. Uh, tomorrow's our last, our last wedding for a while until we go to Mexico. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is a really odd year for us. Because of the fact that um, we poured ourselves into the mayoral campaign that we did last year. Yeah. So we didn't do the greatest job of promoting our wedding business. And because of that, we just have like a really weird 
like we're super we were booked solid all through january and the most of february yeah and then like march april may are like dead yeah and then the rest of the year is pretty pretty okay it's just like gonna be weird to have like three months of just silence we literally had the like the exact same issue last last year um if you don't know, I, I started working for the county of Riverside doing photo video. I, I do know. Okay. I do know. And uh, when when all that happened, that all happened like around July. When all that happened, I really put everything on the back burner. I was so focused on on that. I felt like I, I don't know, I just felt like I had a lot on my plate. So I didn't advertise our wedding photography for, for a long time. I wasn't consistent with posts and I didn't do any blogs. And um, I think we we definitely took a hit for that. And I, we knew that was going to happen, but it, we just weren't, we just didn't worry about it, but, but we're seeing the results of that. We didn't get hardly, a, you know, we normally, we only book about 15 weddings a year. Cause I, cause I have a, I've always had a full-time job. So we, we try to stick to just right. 15 below 20. And usually around this time we're already have, you know, a good eight, nine, 10 <laughs> weddings booked. But, uh, um, sure. we were all, at the beginning of the year, we were only at like five weddings. So we definitely were like, oh, we we have almost no weddings this year. <laughs> yeah. So um, the last three, you know, the off season, the last like three months, um, I've definitely been pushing our marketing, um, and I've talked about that recently, and and it's actually helping. Like we've been we've been booking weddings now. We're starting to book for next year, and it's just funny to see how like when you actually put effort into it, it's mm-hmm. like you really do see the results. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm going to be doing. Spending a lot of my time on this month is just sort of a marketing blitz yeah. of uh, reestablishing ourselves, essentially. Because um, it's weird. Because it's like you get sort of in your mind that like you're like, oh, I'm the super established photographer. I've been doing this for over a decade. Everyone should know who I am. Yeah. But you know, the truth is, like these brides, they get engaged, and until they get engaged, they're not like necessarily looking at wedding photography yeah. um, or photographers. So unless you shot a wedding for someone they know, there's no way they know who you are. Yeah. And so it's just about like getting our name back out there into the mass populace and, and sort of not necessarily starting over, but just reintroducing ourselves, maybe do like a brand refresh to kind of like update things. Yeah, and there's constantly more photographers entering the industry every year too. So, Absolutely. You know, I, I like wedding photographers. I'm glad people are choosing to do that. But I mean, it is, you know, it becomes like more or less a competition, right? Oh, 100%. Um, 100%. So uh, let's remind the listeners a little bit about about who you are. You came on uh, when you guys came down uh, to shoot a wedding uh, you and Luke came down to shoot video for a wedding, right? In San Diego, yep. San Diego, it's beautiful San Diego, uh, with mm-hmm. all the. Yep. You you might remember that episode because there was airplanes flying overhead the entire <laughs> every five minutes. <laughs> yeah, we we actually recorded the episode at the airport. At the airport. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just, you know, give my listeners a little refresh. You 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 shoot sure. weddings with your wife, and you have a couple other businesses that you run. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So my name is Dustin and I'm an alcoholic. No, (laughs) (laughs) my name is Dustin. I uh, am a wedding photographer based out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, For most of you that don't know, that's kind of near Chicago. And then I run the Wedding Photo Hangover podcast all by myself. No help from anyone. (laughs) Um, Sometimes we have this guy on named Stephen Van Elk. the talks a lot. And on top of that, I run a video company called Big Burrito Creative. Uh, funny name, great videos. That's our tagline. <laughs> Don't steal it. Um, it's copyrighted, and that's right? What, that's right. <laughs> and that keeps us pretty busy. And then I thought, why not add more to my plate? And the last two years, uh, we've been really getting heavily involved in real estate photography. Yeah. So we've been venturing into that um, and just kind of letting that evolve naturally, so to speak. Um, And that's been kind of a fun, interesting area of photography that I've never really thought of exploring. So that's kind of really what we've been up to as a business. Um, So weddings, real estate, and commercial videography. Uh, a few wedding videos here and there, but mainly just focusing our video 
time and energy on commercial stuff. Commercial stuff. And uh, did, you started with the wedding stuff first, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, I uh, did weddings all my life. Been doing it for about 12 years. Uh, I just kind of fell into it. Went to college for photography and sort of fell into photography through that, like, I was into it. It was that perfect age of people graduating college, getting married right out of college, asking that friend, like, hey, like, you have a camera. And um, just started shooting weddings and never been able to kind of fall out of it. So just, you know, we've done high volume the last three years. Um, and then last year it was kind of been the first year where we really slowed things down and trying to figure out how we want to balance it all out this year. So that that's the reason I wanted to bring you on too, to talk a little bit more about the, not so much the wedding stuff, but you know, the other stuff that mm-hmm. you're doing, the real estate, the business stuff. I feel like photographers, sure. uh, you know, especially when they're considering, Going freelance, I guess I can talk for myself. When we were going to make the jump to go freelance, we were we were talking about different ways to supplement our income. And last year we just started we started like a sub a sub business just focused on commercial and multimedia production, and then just mm-hmm. so happened to at the same time uh, got offered that job doing exactly that, but for for the county. Um, which is awesome. Yeah, which is, I mean, it, it's still kind of, I still go to work. I'm like, I can't believe they're just, you know, I'm definitely in an office environment that is does not pertain to the arts or anything creative at all. So I'm just right. waiting for them to be like, we don't actually need you anymore. We're <laughs> 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 waiting for them to let me go. But uh, things have been pretty good there. Uh, but yeah, we were talking about uh, ways to supplement our income, uh, stuff that we can do, especially throughout the week, because most of our weekends are taken up with weddings. So, uh, sure. we, we were already getting hired to do little, like, you know, little small business stuff here and there, but we never posted it anywhere because we were so concentrated on marketing just our wedding stuff. Um, mm-hmm. so we finally created a space to, to put all that out there. So, um, wh- what made you want to actually like start creating, these like sub businesses in, in real estate and multimedia. Yeah. I mean, so the, the biggest thing I was always told and I've learned through the years is when people know you shoot weddings, they assume that that's all you can do. Um, it's as if your camera has the wedding mode on it and (laughs) you can do nothing else with that camera. So I wanted to quickly sort of, separate our different business entities because I wanted things to be able to move sort of freely without someone saying like, oh, I mean, they could know me and know my reputation as a wedding photographer. That was fine. But I didn't want someone to be like, oh, I don't know. Are you sure you want to hire him for that like $50,000 commercial video project? I mean, he's just a wedding photographer. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start building a reputation on on like a different platform doing videos that was separate from our reputation as a wedding photographer. Not to say that like a wedding photography has a bad rep, but there's definitely, at least here in the Midwest, this connotation that like, you know, hey, those guys don't, you know, know what they're doing. Yeah. I don't want to trust them with these big budget projects. Or the opposite where they're like, well, he's a wedding photographer. I bet you we can lowball him and get him to do this, you know, super elaborate video for a lot less because he's a wedding photographer. Yeah. So we sort of separated church and state also because we were trying to grow a team when it comes to what uh, video. So we have a team of people that we work with and I wanted them to be able to go do smaller projects without me um, and somebody not be like, oh, wait, where's Dustin and Corinne? Yeah. So just constantly trying to separate those brands and then same with the real estate we're working on that right now is trying to make an, its own brand for that so that we can train people to go shoot homes for us. So that way, again, I'm just trying to build these different brands up that I don't necessarily have to be there, which right now the Dustin and Corinne brand, I have to be there. Yeah. Um, and as I get older and my kids get older, I'm trying to build up these businesses that don't always require the me. Yeah. I can still be the one behind the scenes pulling the strings, making sure everything's going well, but I don't have to necessarily be at the shoot all the time. And are you trying to do that with uh, 
with the wedding photography as well? Are you going to yep. split that so off at some point? This year, well, actually, just two weeks ago, we launched officially Union Chapel Photo. Mm, I think um, I heard you guys talking about that. Yep. So that's our associate brand. And we're trying to build that up from the ground to essentially get the brand recognition to the place where our Dustin and Corinne one is. So that way we can charge the same thing. And then if I want, then I could jump in and shoot a wedding under that brand and make the same margins as the Dustin and Corinne brand. So that one's going to take a little bit more time because it's a brand new name. It's a brand new face um, of just slowly building that up. Um, but the same kind of holds true. I don't know if you or any of your listeners have associate shooters, um, but we just ran into the roadblock of being a husband wife team where somebody contacts us and we would say, oh, sorry, uh, we're not available, but X, Y, Z is. Yeah. Um, most people, if they're contacting a husband and wife team, you know, they want the husband and wife team. Um, and that was just something we didn't envision at the onset of branding as a husband and wife team. Um, and so now that we're older and have kids and we're like, okay, we want a few more Saturdays back without necessarily, uh, taking a huge hit to our income. So we need to start building out these other avenues. I think we're, we we have a similar issue, but you know we're we're known as a husband and wife team, but you know both our names aren't on. <laughs> Correct. So we're Correct. so I it's easy for me to explain like oh no you're you're getting me for sure, but Maria may right. not always be there. Or sometimes we've we've shot two weddings on the same day, and you know Maria went and shot one wedding, I shot the other, and there wasn't an, an issue. And that so. and that was always a lot easier to double book when I'd be like oh yeah, uh, you get either Corinne or I. Yeah. And that was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. fine with that. Yeah. But now it's just being that she works and I work and it just seems like we see such little of each other that I actually enjoy shooting with her so much. I don't know if she feels the same way. But um, <laughs> that I don't want her to go shoot with someone else. I want her to shoot with me. Yeah. So are you going to eventually like let go of the Dustin and Corinne name and just focus um, more on the other one? I don't think I would ever just let go of it. I mean, if somebody came in through that, I mean, what I would probably do um, is once we can get Union Chapel up to the same price point, then I would just bump the Dustin and Corinne price point so that it's constantly always just that little bit more. Yeah. um, So that they're just essentially paying a higher, you know, for a higher value. We would just keep trying to figure out ways to add more value to that brand. Yeah. Um, whereas the other brand, I'm essentially, in other words, phasing my wife out of the equation. Yeah. Um, sounds like I'm leaving her or she's leaving me, but <laughs> just want to be able to give her um, uh, more weekends because yeah. she's also a doctor uh, three days a week. And so her time is precious, at least while the kiddos are little. Yeah, I, f- I feel you, man. I'm uh, Maria loves, absolutely loves shooting weddings, but um, if if I can you know, down the line, definitely we want to have less, less, we want to have more weekends off. Um, Mm -hmm. so at the, at the very least, if I can provide that for her to get started on it, you know, recently I've changed all my, my packages and pricing structure so that, um, so that all our packages, packages actually start with just one photographer, me and, and, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't guarantee her being there. So if I need to just hire a second for the day, that way she can, yeah. you know, have more time off at home, which I'm totally, I'm totally cool with because I can wean her off of shooting so many weekends. And then down the line, when we grow our other businesses that we're trying to grow, then, you know, I'll be also having some of those weekends off. Hopefully we'll see. Hopefully fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you, how are you marketing those businesses like separately because i know i know we you talked about it a little bit it's important to keep them separate because like you said you know if, if people are looking for you as a looking at you as a wedding photographer they don't really feel like you can do anything else but mm-hmm. if you're if you separate all your brands that's what we've kind of done if you go over to our del toro media is what we call it if you go over to our del toro media page you don't see anything related to wedding photography so anybody that's looking for that that you know, type of photo video that they, they won't even associate it with us as wedding photographers, which is I'm assuming what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to be doing this year is I'm going to be migrating all of our wedding video stuff 
uh, under the Union Chapel brand and away from the Big Burrito yeah. brand so that the Big Burrito brand can be a standalone commercial only. Um, and I think and that's like such a daunting task because, you know, we've done video, uh, wedding video under that brand for so long. Um, but we've been doing more and more commercial stuff um, under that name as well. And so it's just like we talked about earlier, trying to separate weddings from commercial stuff is is uh, a big necessity in my opinion. I've seen a lot of people do it really well, keeping both under the same wheelhouse. Um, but I just think for the budgets we're going to be trying to go after this year, it just doesn't make sense to when someone's looking at your portfolio to like necessarily see like, Oh, Jack and Jill's wedding. And then, Oh, this, you know, 60 second commercial you did for the mayor. Yeah. <laughs> like it just, those two things aren't going to be comparable. Yeah. Um, now I'm hoping that we do get work through our wedding referrals, um, through the, you know, I'm always really good about networking with our, bride's parents and groom's parents figuring out like, Hey, do you guys own a business? Like, what do you do for a living? And a lot of our work comes from that. Um, trying to, you know, say like, Hey, you, you run marketing for this small business. Like I would love to, you know, sit down grab coffee with you, see if there's anything outside of weddings that we can, you know, help you with. And most, you know, by the end of the wedding day, they feel like your family because they've spent all this time with you that they're willing to at least sit down and give you coffee or have coffee with you. Um, the trick is just making them understand that like it's going to cost more than a wedding budget, which most of them are already like, God, I just spent how much of my daughter's wedding. Now you're asking me to spend this much on like a brand refresh. Yeah. So, but we've just been attacking where I live. The biggest uh, markets to attack are medical education and um, insurance. So those are like the three big industries where we live. Yeah. So we try to go after companies. We have a plethora of those kind of companies that have the budgets that can afford decent, you know, web quality or social video. And that's sort of our bread and butter. So and how are you? Re- to, how are you reaching out to them? I'm just looking for mutual people that I know personally, and I'm just saying like, hey. Uh, do you think this is something your business, you know, would benefit from? And then I'm also trying to cross promote my real estate stuff by uh, reaching out to builders and saying like, hey, you own this building company that builds custom homes. I've been really working a lot in the real estate industry. Um, I'd love to sit down and meet with you, talk about what we can do in regards to like making a short film about a custom build you've done. Or like what separates you guys from your competition. And a lot are going to say, oh, I'm so busy as it is. I, you know, I don't have time for something like that. Uh, But every now and then you're going to get that progressive thinking person who's like, you know what? I would like something that really makes me look different. I feel like multimedia, you know, when I say multimedia, I'm talking about like commercial work, these types of projects, Mm rebranding, social, social media content. Um, I feel like it's still a very like new market. Um, uh, like you said, you'll find people that are progressive thinking and and know that that's what they need to, to push their business these days. But like, I'm still new to it and I'm just, and I'm actually pretty amazed at like how, you know, especially in government, I work in government and, um, our, our team is very progressive thinking and we have, um, we have a manager who, who wants us to, to be as creative as possible and come up with the things that we're doing and push out, uh, the content that we're pushing. And what I'm seeing is that people are really reacting to it. And, uh, we're seeing other departments, other cities approaching us and they, they don't even have anywhere close to, they don't even have a team of people doing that. It's usually someone who's like a tech or something. Mm -hmm. you know, in their department and they just gave them like, Hey, you know, you're young, you know, social media, can you run our social media stuff? And they're they're like, sure. Can you make it look like LA County and what they're doing? Like, no, they have a team of people over there, you know? And, and I feel like it's, it's just now people are starting to kind of see what is out there, but they're not yet realizing like what it takes to, to build this kind of stuff. So for a lot of, to me, for a lot of people that are interested in, 
you know, creating this new source of income, this is a really good way to go because it's, it's a, it's like a baby business. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like the sweet spot, if you're just looking to start off in commercial, uh, social content, especially is try to find that company that's big enough that they can afford you, but small enough that they can't afford to hire someone full time. Yeah. So like you're looking for like a, a mid-sized restaurant or a mid-sized bar, something where like probably the manager of the restaurant or like some high-end uh, supervisor is doing all this work already. Yeah. So you're, what you're looking for is uh, a proposition where you're, you're taking something off the plate of someone who doesn't want to be doing it. Yeah. Um, and that's where we found our greatest success because these people – you know, they have like the waiters taking the photos of the food or, you know, you have a, uh, the teacher that's on, you know, has a two hour lunch period. She's going around taking pictures or videos on her phone for this school's social media. Um, so those are the type of people that we're going after because there's such low hanging fruit in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. But I feel like uh, when they do stuff like that, too, they I mean, one, those people aren't trained for those things. And sometimes they probably oh, do produce 100. OK things, you know, but yeah, um, but I, I, I don't feel like they they definitely they don't have the experience to kind of produce like the stuff that you're actually, you know. Right. And so what we tell them is, you know, feel free to still keep doing that. Like it's never bad to keep producing content, but let us come in and build you a library of content. So that way you can sprinkle in like really, you know, dynamic professional images here and there that really drive your audience. Um, You know, highlight things like promotions, things like special events. Uh, But then, you know, let your employee that does it, let them do the day to day Insta stories or, you know, Snapchat or whatever you're finding to be successful. Um, But let us be, you know, the professional content that you guys deliver on a, you know, every other day or once a week, whatever, you know, you find is the best means. Um, What I'd really love to do is partner with someone who knows uh, social uh, as far as numbers and strategies, because I feel like if I could partner with someone like that, we could just dominate from a content side and then the the social delivery side. But that is just such a huge slippery slope and it's so, so ever changing that I haven't even begun to jump down that black hole. Yeah. Give, give me an idea of like some of the different projects that you've done. Cause I mean, like, like I've said, multimedia is such a, like a broad scale. You've done real estate, you've done, uh, some Mm -hmm. commercials, you know, let me know about some of the actual projects that you've worked on. Yeah. Last year was sort of a weird year for us. So we ran a political campaign. So we ran everything from social to TV commercials to print media. Um, and they were totally, they were totally cool hiring big burrito creative for that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, so what happened was um, we were working for the opponent of the incumbent. So the guy who was already in office, we got hired to shoot uh, video and photo, uh, like essentially create a social library for yeah. him. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, so I budgeted my upcoming year to work for his campaign. And then he was kind of get, being real wishy-washy on whether or not he was going to follow through with that commitment. And in the meantime, I had done the current mayor's daughter's wedding. And so I had this relationship with her and I knew that her dad works really closely with the campaigns in the past. And so I reached out to her and my friend who works in the mayor's office and tried to, you know, start a line of communication. And I just said, Hey, I budgeted working on a mayoral campaign. I really don't care who it's for. Um, you know, my checkbook doesn't care if it's Republican or Democrat. Um, I just want to do creative content for someone running for office because I think it would be really fun. And they were like, yeah, let's set up uh, a sit down. And so they put me on retainer like the very next day and then paid me, you know, bonuses based on, you know, if it was my idea or like their idea or whatever. And did you come up with that? Was that, was that your... Did you yeah, because they, they, so it was a, a whole new campaign strategy. They essentially took their budget that they were going to put towards hiring a campaign manager and instead gave that to me and said, we think we can drive the campaign because 
this guy's already been in office three times. Mm -hmm. We think we know how a campaign is run here on the local level. So we'll do all the minutia of running like fundraisers and doing all of that. And all we need you to do is just constantly be be producing creative social content uh, for social media. And then they liked the content so much, they're like, okay, we need you to start turning those into 30 second commercials. And I was like, um, I've never made a like actual TV commercial. Uh, all I've done is like web commercials and web ads. And they're like, it's okay, you'll figure it out. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> great. So what what kind of, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, it was just like, so it was like kind of a crazy year of like learning as I went. I've yeah. never worked in the political spectrum at all. Um, and I've since had several uh, political people call me to ask me like for advice and how we were able to pull off certain things that we were able to pull off because they've never in the history of a, a city the size of ours been able to someone attack us with an attack ad over the weekend and then we would make a video on Monday morning and have it on TV by Monday night responding to that attack yeah just to you know it it just completely changed the landscape of yeah. a, a political smear campaign. Yeah. And it was really fun to take all of the credit for him winning. Yeah, I was about to say they and and he won too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we we won by the highest margins of any mayor in our wow. city's history. Wow. Um and he's also the longest uh term mayor in the state's history. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we had good odds going in because obviously he's been mayor for a long time. People liked him. Um, but the guy that was running, like, I just think to myself, if he had kept me on, I think we could have won with him as well because he just didn't do anything yeah. to help himself. He went negative right out the gate and it was just nasty. So you made, you made yourself, uh, the way you budgeted it, was so that you made yourself available to do those kinds of things, like shoot a video Monday morning, have it out the same day kind of thing? Yeah, so what I did is before I signed on, I made sure we had a, a good team in place here with our company that we would have the hours. So essentially they put me on retainer and then I put my team on almost like a mini retainer to budget so many hours a week to work on campaign-related things. And then we just, I mean... Nobody loved it, let me tell you. I mean, it was a grind, especially at the end. But, you know, everyone was paid really well and taken care of. And I yeah. made sure that nobody left unhappy on my side of things. Yeah. Um, I never wanted anyone to feel like they were not not appreciated. Yeah. Because we worked a lot of long hours. There were a lot of, like, quick change turnarounds on edits. And um, it was a full full team operation. But yeah, I would. There would be times where I would shoot something, and I would be dropboxing it to one of our editors on the way to the next shoot, so that he could have a draft up within the next few hours. And and how was it trying to manage all that while also having like weddings involved? Did you have weddings during during? Oh, that time? absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent had weddings. Um, so it was it wasn't as bad because the. Uh, as I thought it would be, the only bad month was October because the election's the first weekend in November. Yeah. So October was a bit crazy because that's also like when you're here in Indiana is crazy for photography in general because the leaves start changing colors. So yeah. all of your 2020 brides are like, I want to do my engagement photos because red leaves are so pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but so I just had to like, buckle up and just tell my wife my wife was amazing and super supportive and I just kept saying you know like we just have to get through this month and then it's all over like we just have to get through this month and we said that for a few months and, <laughs> are you gonna um, do it again it, uh I don't know if she would let me do another campaign <laughs> um I would I would enjoy it I learned a ton um it was I mean, but it was easy for me because it was for somebody running in my city. Yeah. I don't know if it would be as easy to like uh, pick up and like go do it for somebody like, you know, running for Congress in yeah. Arizona yeah. or somebody running in Milwaukee, but it w because I don't have a connection, but I'm sure I could figure it out. I've done a few things for some local politicians and for I've, 
I've more or less sworn off of it for now because I just, dude, I I really dislike politics, and I thought maybe I could get into it if I was going to get paid for it, and uh, you know, for now I just yeah I don't want to do it. <laughs> I find myself like yeah not enjoying my time with whoever's in front of the camera. You know what I mean? Like everything just yeah. feels fake to me, and you know, I mean, those are all my own opinions, but uh, yeah, yeah, I swore. Well, it, that it, was. Yeah. And that was the problem is is trying to change the landscape of what they're used to shooting for political ads yeah. and trying to personalize them, trying to humanize them and make them relatable. And every time I'd go to a fundraiser uh, to photograph, uh, people would be like, wait, you're the one who shoots all of the commercials? And I'd be like, yeah. And they're like, oh my gosh, like they're so good. And for once, it, instead of people like trying to fast forward through political commercials, like you found that people were actually like enjoying the political commercials, yeah. which was like kind of a game changer for us as a, a campaign. Yeah. Because instead of it being like, I'm, you know, such and such running for office and I support this message, it was like sweeping drone shots of the city and like highlighting all of the awesomeness happening in the city with epic dynamic shots. And then cutting to like a well-known restauranteur yeah. who's like killing it, talking about how great things are going. And, you know, people are like, oh, I love that guy. I love his restaurant. So you're like loving him because you love him. You're like, yeah. oh, I love the guy that's mayor because he's helping him. Yeah. And you're like, boom, you're psychologically just been, you know, yeah. now you're voting for him. So you learn how to mind fuck people, basically. Exactly. <laughs> it's called politics. I think <laughs> that is politics. All just all politics. Yeah, man. <laughs> I fi- well here in California, man. There's so many different things that you can do that I just for now I swore off of it. I'm like I'm not going to do any political videos. There's so many more things I could focus on. Uh, well, the last time I did something political, I got in a lot of trouble. So I've been sort of afraid to get back <laughs> into politics what until I did this mayoral run. Uh, back when I lived in Indianapolis, um, I got asked to photograph a um, town hall meeting with a senator. And I was like, sure, whatever. So I show up to this like country town in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's like all these farmers. And the senator like shows up 30 minutes late. And I photograph him like answering questions. And then... Um, the senator's office calls me and they're like, Hey, we really like those photos you took of that round table. Uh, can you send those to us? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. I've already been paid for it. Yeah. And then that's when I found out all about campaign finance law. <laughs> and if a, uh, political, you know, action party thing pays you to do something, they can't, you can't like give any of the end result to the politician. They can like set up events, but they can't like pay money to the politician directly. Yeah. And so the photos were as if they paid the, the politician, I guess. Yeah. And so lawyers were involved and it was like oh a whole gosh. thing. And at the end of the day, the, poli- uh, the senator ended up having to pay me the full price that they paid for the photos. <laughs> So I got paid twice. <laughs> you got paid twice. I mean, so it worked out great for me. You got in trouble, except you got paid twice. <laughs> but I never am gonna probably get to shoot for that senator again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. There's a lot of so. W- tell me about the TV stuff. What are some of the logistics involved with that? Because I have been curious about that. Um. So it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Um. There was just a lot of um. You know, making sure that we're shooting at the right, you know, profile and the right uh, timing and talking to the TV channels that we're going to be submitting the spots to, to make sure that like our stuff lined up with their formats. Um, Because last thing you want, especially when you're working under the gun to get things submitted in a tight uh, deadline, is to submit it the wrong way. And then they boot it because it's not right or they run it and then you see like, like some stations wanted you to have a slate at the beginning to say like, you know, who the ad agency was that produced this contact information, what the commercial was, but then they like cut that out before they air it. Um, and then some didn't want that. So it was just kind of like making sure we had all of our formats, right? So we just created like different export, uh, presets for final cut or premiere, depending on what we're using. Um, so that we'd get it right each time based on 
And then we just run it through like, this is for Fox. This is for ABC. And and you were the one that and then we have was one in for like contact Comcast. with them? Um, I would, I would contact the news station. Well, I would try to contact like an ad agency I know yeah. and be like, Hey, can you like send me over the spec sheets for all the different, um, news channels? Yeah. Um, because we only have like two major news channels that are like local entities and then you have Comcast. Um, and we would submit to those three. So we would have Fox and we have ABC and then we have Comcast who'd run it like during HGTV and run it during like, you know, all of those different channels. But um, that wasn't too bad. Once we got the hang of the different exports, it was it was fine. We only had a few instances where uh, towards the end we were running the spots through ad agent through an ad agency because they were buying the spots. So that was the only thing that I never really got to learn is about like buying TV spots. Um, and that's something I would like to learn, um, but it, I tried to ask about it. I tried to have it explained to me, but it just mm. seems like such a weird, outdated system that's been done a, done this way since like before time. That's, that, that's probably why they don't want to explain it to you. <laughs> well, it's just like so you buy you buy points, and then you buy points for different channels, and then like there's different values for different timing based on when that like if it's going to be during prime time or if it's going to be in the middle of the day um and like how you buy it like you can buy it in blocks and you can buy you know it's just very it seems like man this could have been could be done a lot easier in a more updated way yeah so something like a political campaign how much how much creative power do you have in something Uh, i started with like very little in the video space um (laughs) but I had like a lot of creative power in the photography space mm-hmm. because I was mainly hired on to do photography and then I they knew I did video. Um, and so I'm like, oh, I'll just do video alongside my photography. And they ended up liking my video better than the guy they were going to use. And that's how our social video ended up also becoming the TV video. So I ended up probably saving them thousands of dollars because I never asked I never like tried to renegotiate my contract to include TV stuff Um, I just asked that I be paid a little bit more for like licensing music differently and the time that it took extra for the editing Um, but what they would have probably been paying for each TV spot would have been probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars and we shot a total of about 30 spots Throughout the and, whole campaign? Yeah, throughout the whole campaign. Yeah. Some days we'd shoot like three. Um, but I mean, not all 30 of those ran. We would run like one a week. Um, and were you involved then, in like the scripting of all this stuff? Uh, yeah, for the most yeah. part. Um, the So an ad agency was running um, a lot of the show in terms of the logistics, like finding talent and locations and stuff like that. And then I was directing the spots when I would get on set and running running the cameras, running the lighting, running the audio. And then I'd have people helping me with all of that that I would bring with me. Um, and then they would give me a script of what they were after like the day before. I would give them my notes on how I think we should change it. Uh, the tough thing is I've never produced anything for TV where you had to have everything down to the second. Yeah. So the beautiful thing when you're doing something for web is you're like, oh, it's 46 seconds versus what you thought would be 45. It's like, no biggie. Yeah. But for this, it's like you had to, we would have to like read through the script and say it in a, you know, thoughtful way where we thought, okay, that can be said in 30 seconds or less. And there would have to be often times where I, in the editing bay, you know, like I'm speeding their phrasing up in certain spots to yeah. create pauses in other spots so it felt natural so that I could cut to some B-roll um, without it being constant talking. I'm sorry that I've stuck to this whole mayoral campaign, but I feel like oh, fine. there's so many, so much, I feel like that you you said it yourself, you like learned a lot from just this experience alone. And I, I, can, I have a billion questions about <laughs> everything that you did. 
Um, sure. What about like uh, working with like graphics, text graphics, motion graphics? Do you do you use any resources for that? Do you create everything your own, your team? I I'm, I lost you for a second there. Oh, Ulysses. sorry. I asked about. You're um, back. I asked about graphics. Like, what do you use for text graphics, motion graphics? Do you do you have a resource for that, or do you use your team to create it? Do you create them? So we just kind of created. Um, after the first few videos, we kind of had a guy who created the motion graphics for those for us, and then we would just kind of recycle those in order to keep our videos looking consistent every single time. Uh, I mean, we animated the mayor's logo and its text, and then we tried to keep a consistent color palette to match the theme of the campaign um, with his colors he was using. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't, I never personally ever like to dip my toe in motion graphics. That's I always say, find the things you're really good at and then find people that are even better than you. Yeah. Um, so the only thing crazy that we ever had to really do editing wise is there was one day towards the end of the campaign that we shot um, a cityscape of the mayor defending crime and we wanted to do it with the police station in the background and it was pouring down rain. So we did it inside from a skyscraper across the street that we could get access to like picture windows. And mm -hmm. then we put him with the window behind him. Uh, and then they asked me if we could drop in a faux sky in the, uh, in the background. And so, I'll, you know, I go through my Rolodex of awesome motion graphics guys. <laughs> and sure enough, I'm like, I know this guy will be able to do it. And we got it done. And, um, if you know it's fake, it obviously looks fake, but for a 30 second spot and there's some B roll cut in between him talking, um, you know, there's pretty, I think it looked pretty believable, but that was the first time I've ever played with dropping in uh, sky yeah. into uh, a moving video. Yeah. I would have flipped out. I wouldn't know where to start with that. <laughs> well, as a photographer, cause I mean, you have to remember I'm a photographer yeah. first, a videographer second. So it's like in my mind, I'm like, Oh, I'm sure there's a way to just like mask it out and like <laughs> cut out the sky and then drop in a layer. Um, but then where it gets tricky is like when the mayor's head starts to move yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's got white hair and the sky is white. So then yeah. you see a cloud float across his forehead. I had to do something similar where, um, the, the scene was somebody watching a scene on their phone oh. and, and then it pans out and it goes into them talking, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the thing was the phone had that screen, that uh, that glass over it where when you turn it slightly, you can't really see the image, right? Sure. So we couldn't see the video. So basically I had to, um, I had to map out you know, the graphic on the phone and I, mm -hmm. I'd never done anything like that. So luckily it was like a 15 or no, it was probably like a six or seven second shot of that. So mm -hmm. I literally went frame by frame adjusting all, all the points I made and moving them slightly. <laughs> it was a pain, but I was like, man, if this was something, anything longer than 10 seconds, I would have like, I would have hated myself, you know, for, for committing. See, to I did like that. that. I did that one time and it was the only time Steven and I ever did a video version of our podcast Yeah, um, where I went frame by frame and mask out his computer screen to have our logo on it. Ah, I did. I do remember that. And I thought, oh, this won't be that hard. It'll be pretty easy. And then we realized that a couple of times we would move our mics and our mics would break the oh, line on the TV, the line of the screen. They were attached and, to the desk. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's funny. I never even noticed that. You guys fooled me on that one. That's what we do. We're like <laughs> magicians. Notice we haven't done another video podcast since. I know. What's up with that, man? You guys need to bring it back. Uh, yes. We just need more time. Maybe for like the, the 200th episode or something, you guys should do a video one. Well, this I'm hoping, um, so this May, our uh, studio manager will be moving back to town full-time. And so I'm hoping when she's here uh, full-time, we can start incorporating some of the podcast workload onto her plate uh, during whenever she has some downtime, which hopefully yeah. she doesn't have downtime and because that would mean that our businesses are all super busy. Yeah. But um, if she does, I want to start like taking some off Steve's plate and giving it to her. Oh, nice. Uh, what do you, um, let's talk about some real estate a little bit. So, sure. um, when did you start getting into that? 
Yeah. So real estate, it's just, I tell people real estate photography is not something to get into if you're already like super busy. Um, and it really depends on your market. Like you have to analyze like the, the place that you're living, um, the population size, how many homes are hitting the market every week. Um, so Fort Wayne is a midsize regional city. Um, it's not very big. So I got into it to actually answer your question. Um, a bride's mom, who's a realtor, called me up and said, hey, the normal guy I use to shoot my homes is um, on some mission trip doing something. Can you come shoot this house for me? I said, I've got a 14 millimeter lens. Like, sure. You know, how hard can this be? I shoot venue shots. I shoot, you know, hotel room shots when I'm doing weddings. You know, I know how to shoot a room and light it and make it look good. And so I, I show up, no tripod or anything. Um, and I've got light stands and lights and I'm going crazy for this like hundred thousand dollar house, um, way overboard. Yeah. And, uh, she's like, Oh my gosh, like these pictures are amazing. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to like do this for her all the time, I got to figure out a way to maximize my time and efficiency. And so I started researching like how people shoot real estate and how to make, uh, make it work for you. And I quickly realized, okay, first I need to start putting my camera on a tripod and I need to start letting the ambient light do a lot of the heavy lifting and then just start popping like one light, um, here and there versus like constantly moving light stands around going up and down stairs and making it seem like I'm shooting a hundred thousand dollar corporate, you know, commercial for the Hyatt instead of just shooting this small dinky house. Yeah. So I started shooting for her and then word spread to other agents. Um, and then I was like, you know what, this could be kind of fun. So I found like the busiest agent in our city and I said, Hey, let me shoot your next listing for free. Um, just so you can see if this is something you would like. And I did that and he's used me ever since. And because he's the busiest agent and he's also the most active on social media, um, he's constantly getting people asking him who's shooting his homes to the point where he's actually getting business um, because of me. So like people see like, wow, no matter if I have a million dollar house or a $50,000 house, like he has professional photos taken and like so he keeps using me he keeps getting more business it's very good for both of us and um and i just keep slowly picking up more and more agents um every now and then if i see an agent that i like went to high school with posting like really shitty photos on facebook like i'll reach out to them and say like hey i don't know if you know this but i've i've been starting to shoot uh, a lot of real estate listings um if this is something you'd be interested in let me know i'd love to talk with you yeah and it's like 50 50. Some people are like, no, I'm happy shooting it on my iPad. And some people are like, oh my gosh, thank you. That would be super helpful. Um, so then, uh, just, you know, I like to do five to eight, maybe homes a week. Yeah. And, um, and you know, that's a pretty comfortable number for me right now until I can get more people that can shoot with me for me. Um, because I don't, really want to be waking up at 5 a.m. and shooting houses until dark and then spending my whole evening editing them. And um, are you shooting video for these houses too? When we first started, we were um, just to be different than everybody else. And then we just realized that like a lot of the agents, uh, they're not marketing people. They, you know, they're, they're sort of clueless when it comes to how to market because they're so used to like, oh, I just put these photos on online and yeah and the house should sell right and so a lot of them would be like oh video sounds cool yeah go ahead do that and then you give them this video and they're like okay um what do i do with this video yeah and you're like um you put it on social media they're like oh i don't i don't do facebook and you're like okay Okay. So I'm at the, I'm at like the beginning stages with, uh, I've never done real estate. Um, I have Mm -hmm. a friend who, who's gotten into it and he asked me to do some work. Same kind of thing. I did the first thing for free, especially since I hadn't done it. Right. Uh, Um, but he's definitely, uh, 
an agent who is on social media. He's young. He's taking advantage mm-hmm. of all the social media platforms. He's got his own YouTube channel. He's putting out tips. And yeah. obviously in, in this time and day. So with those type yeah. of agents, yeah. video is a lot more prevalent. Yeah. So that's kind of like, uh, uh, I like where he's going because I feel like if I can attach myself to someone like him and create some really cool photos and videos for him, then there's going to be mm-hmm. other agents that are, kind of in the same boat that are, you know, following in line with that and try to get some yeah. of them. Yeah. Absolutely. And so like we we have zero agents um that do any of that here locally. Yeah. Um we have a few agents that are like trying to get better at like Instagram stories. <laughs> yeah. Uh and the occasional like Facebook live video where they're like, "Let me tour you through my open house today." Yeah. Uh, in which they're just like on their phone on like a little like selfie stick. Um, but I do know that in like the bigger markets where the homes are selling for a lot more money and they take a lot more work to sell them, um, doing those sort of lifestyle esque videos where like you do a video tour of the house and then you like maybe do uh, a cool interview with the realtor where he's like walking through the house and like looking all awesome and like Mm -hmm. badass. Like I would love to shoot those kind of videos. It's just that there's not much of a, um, market here for that as of now. Um, I'm hoping, I think like with the rise of HGTV, you just, I'm seeing like all of these people try to become realtors. Yeah. It's like the new big rush. They're like, oh, the market is so hot. Houses are selling so fast. Like it's so easy to be a realtor. Um, so like it's one of the number one saturated jobs right now in my city. And, uh, I'm just I'm not seeing many of my agents try to separate themselves. So what I'm trying to do is educate them on ways to separate themselves, Yeah. but then trying to get them to pay for it. That's what I'm finding is the biggest hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard enough just to get them to pay for photos. Yeah. And then on top of that being like, Hey, let me shoot this like $800 social media video for you. Um, which in my mind, like $800 is seems real low for the amount of time and energy and effort that I would put into it. And then I'm like, do I really want to be shooting like, you know, five of these videos every week? Yeah. That's kind of where I'm stuck right now, man. I haven't figured out like a pricing structure for this stuff. Um, honestly, if if uh, other real estate agents are, are listening to this, it's probably the best time to get in contact with me because I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff for cheap, just trying to get some experience and figuring out what, you know, what people are so, even willing to pay for some of these things. So the sweet spot for photography I found in our area is between 125 and 225 and I'm at the I decided I'm going to just be at the highest end of that price point. So I'm 225, I'm the most expensive in the area. Um and I know that like to a wedding photographer or anyone really in photography, you're like, "Oh my god, 225, that's like nothing. Like I wouldn't get yeah. out of bed for less than $500." Yeah. Um or, or like I could go shoot a family session for like 3 to $500. Yeah. Um but like I can knock out a house in like 30 minutes. Yeah. Um so in my mind, and most of the time no one's at the house. I've got my headphones on. And, you know, I get a lockbox code, I show up, I make my own schedule, these agents send you an address, and I'll try to stack them based on where they are, so I'm, like, driving the least amount of time. Yeah. And, you know, you go shoot, like, four houses, you make $800, um, and it's, like, not a bad morning. Yeah. You know, if you can knock out four houses in the morning, pick your kids up from school and you just made eight hundred dollars. Yeah. And the editing is so light if you shoot it really well. Yeah. Um, where all you have to do is the occasional dodge and burn to maybe bring back some detail in a window or brighten a ceiling or or whatever. Um, and then you just shoot it right over to them and you, and you don't ever have to deal with like, oh, can you fix stray hair or like <laughs> yeah. edit my yeah. acne? It's like because yeah. you can't legally edit much in a real estate photo because it has to be true to what the house looked like. Yeah. Um, every now and then you'll run into a unethical realtor who will try to get you to manipulate something. And I just come back and I'm like, sorry, man. Um, I can't edit anything per like MLS guidelines. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, d- I didn't even think about that. Uh, the house that the first house we did, they were still living in it. And you know, that was kind of my question cause I was new to it. I was like, are you okay with, all this stuff here and he's like this is 
yeah, this is the house. It's, they're still living in it. This is what's here. I mean, you know, I can't really change much other than like clean up the area. You know what I mean? So yeah, we pretty much just shot it as, as is. Yeah. And every agent's different. I mean, the house I just, I was at actually before I came on this podcast with you, you know, um, um, it was a house where she, you know, lived in the house for 25 years, just had like a bunch of stuff. And so we, we, me and the agent, like the agent was there. The owner was there. We were like moving stuff out of the room. I'd shoot the room. Then we'd move stuff back in. And I mean, that's very abnormal. Um, but it does every, it happen every now and then. Yeah. And because this eight, you know, I like to do my best to do whatever's going to make the house sell fast because if the house sells fast, the agents keep hiring me. And if that means like moving a few boxes of crap into the next room for like five minutes and moving them back. Yes. Does it add on to my time? I'm at the house, but I charge them an extra fee when I invoice them for my extra time. But, and it probably doesn't happen as often too. No. And then as soon as they see that on the first invoice, they either are like, Oh, that's, that's not that bad. And, or at the next house, they show up half an hour early and make sure the shit's all moved and cleaned and ready mm-hmm. to go. Um, before I get there. Uh, another question I have for you. Do you need to have a drone to do real estate photography? <laughs> uh, I don't think you have to have a drone. A lot of people are asking for it. I, I'm i not a drone pilot, but... Uh, I think know. it makes you more sexy as a uh, photographer. It gives you <laughs> that like, oh, you have a drone? Um, well, I just lie so, to people and tell them I have it, but you know, I don't yeah, use well, it. So, what, I'm trying to keep that sexy factor. You're in California, so it's warm there all the time. Yeah. So, like today, for example, like uh, the real estate agent didn't like really care if she, I got drone stuff or not, and it's like probably 20 degrees, and like ground is covered in snow. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not getting out of my car to photograph the exterior of this home, so I just like throw the drone in the air, and I shoot the whole outside, and then like reach out my window, grab the drone. <laughs> pull it in, you know, turn it off, pull it into my car and I drive away. Yeah. Um, so for me, like doing the drone a lot of times it just saves me time. Yeah. Um, plus it's kind of a, another advantage to, for the agents who hire me because most agents are like, I don't need a drone shot. Yeah. You know, the house is in a neighborhood and then you show them like this shot of the house from like a hundred feet up shooting down and they're like, Oh wow, that makes it look cool. And then they call me up and they say, hey, Dustin, I got another house in the same neighborhood. And I say, oh, was it because of the photos from the last house? And like, yeah, actually it was. Um, So people are like constantly looking on Zillow and Realtor.com and those different sites at what homes are going for in their neighborhood. And when they see homes pop up and they're like, oh, wow, those photos make that house look awesome. Wow, they listed it way higher than I thought. And then they say, oh, wow, it's sold. Yeah. And I, oh, I want to call that agent. So anytime that agent's doing well, that means I'm doing well. Yeah. I'm sure it makes a big difference. Uh, like I said, I don't fly a drone now. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm barely <laughs> dipping my toes into the real estate industry. Uh, so I imagine down the what, line what, that would what's be... What's the scare? What's the scare factor, Ulysses? Uh, there's no scare factor, man. I just, I've never, I've never really been... Uh, I don't know. I just never really got into wanting to have a drone. Uh, I feel like it could make for some really cool shots, but it's almost like, um, almost the same reason I never bought the tilt shift lens, you know, like when I rented it, it was really cool. I got some cool images out of it, but I didn't Mm -hmm. really see myself like using it a whole lot. And I felt, I've I've always felt the same way about drones. So, you know, whenever I have, whenever I set my budget for what kind of equipment I'm going to buy, I feel like the drones always last and I just never get to it, you know? Well, they get a little bit cheaper and a little bit better Mm -hmm. every year. And, um, I think we're going to try and buy that new Altel one that just came out, um, because they, the company runs like this great promotion where if you send them your DJI drone, they give you like, I don't know, $800 off or something. Yeah. And I've got like a bunch of phantoms just sitting on my shelf collecting dust. Yeah. So, so you're going to, I think I'm going to stack up some. Some well, I love the Mavic uh, Pro 2, or, uh, but it 
does have its limitations with the geofencing and the different limitations with where you can and cannot fly. And DJI is the only drone company that has to adhere to those rules because yeah. it's the biggest. So, and I'm all about getting around those rules. <laughs> so you're going to get the other drone so you can break those rules. <laughs> well, there's there's a lot of weird uh, farming airports that aren't in use, yeah. but for some reason are still no fly zones around yeah. us. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, with neighborhoods constantly expanding outwards, um, they're starting to get into those a lot of those no fly zones. Yeah. And it's just annoying to constantly apply for permission to fly in an area that is literally a farmland. Yeah. Yeah, that's got to be annoying. So, Especially uh, when I see these people paragliding in them. <laughs> so, wait, where did... Where do people people paraglide in in uh, Indiana? <coughs> so yeah, they do it in like the cornfield areas when the corn after the corn's been plowed. Yeah, um, they'll do like a ATV or a four wheeler, and they get going on the uh, paraglider. Yeah, and then they got like kind of like you would with a boat. But yeah, with an ATV. Well, I was curious because like, I was like, where are they jumping around a cornfield? I was like, where are they jumping from? You guys don't really have any like mountains or anything out there, right? No, definitely don't. <laughs> definitely don't. <laughs> Uh, so people are always talking about like this exit plan, right? As we get older as wedding photographers and, mm-hmm. and doing all that. Um, do you have any other interest in like other businesses that you want to run aside from photography and videography? Oh, I always have interest. Ulysses, I come up with like different business plans every day. <laughs> um, but I think my exit strategy is going to be primarily focused on real estate in terms of owning real estate. Yeah. Um, we own three uh, rental properties right now, and we're trying to just acquire one every year or every other year um, as we see deals and as we see things come on the market. Um, and that's sort of our, our overall game plan. We just dipped our toes into the stock market yeah. uh, this year. Um, well, actually last year now. Um, so curious to see, you know, we're trying now that we have kids and we're in our 30s, we're like, oh, shit. You know, we got to start planning for how we're going to survive the next, uh, you know, post fifties of our lives. Yeah. Plus getting them through school and stuff too. Yeah. I was talking to someone today and they're like, yeah, we thought we'd finish our basement. And then we had kids that were really good at sports and that made (laughs) us essentially have no money ever. And I was like, oh God, (laughs) that's like, that's depressing to think about. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all true, but I feel like you can, you can kind of plan those things out too, you know? I'm hoping. I got friends that are single, they got no kids and, you know, they, they, they asked me about how different it is having a kid and, and I don't know, man, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's hard to do the things that you love to do, run your businesses and have children. Obviously it's a little easier if you don't, if you're single and don't have any kids, there's, you have an advantage, which you should take advantage of. But uh, some people think like, I don't want to have kids because it's going to stop my whole life or something like that. And I, don't, I don't feel like that's the case. I know what's funny is I, I look at my friends who are single and don't have kids. And I think, God, if I could only know what I know now when I was single, the things I would have done differently yeah. in terms of like how I managed my finances. Not that I really like mismanaged my finances. I was just a lot more conservative with my finances uh, when I was single. And I think I would have taken a lot more risks um, investment wise yeah. uh, when I was younger that would be paying off now when I'm in my 30s. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I would have lo- I would have loved to have invested in real estate sooner. Yeah. But because I just look at where the market is now versus what the market was doing 10 years ago and what you could have bought something for 10 years ago. It just boggles my mind. Well, it sounds like you still managed to make some good moves, man. I mean, you've, you've got all this stuff going on. Looks you like gotta, you got to learn to make those moves, yeah, baby, when yeah. you got kids. <laughs> Looks like you got your head on straight, man. <laughs> Our other exit plan is uh, the Wedding Photo Hangover podcast. Um, yeah? Build build that baby up until it's just an empire. Yeah, how many years do you think until it's Until we can a- buy Ulysses out and, uh, <laughs> How many think? How many years do you think until you you create that empire and you're able to walk away from it? Oh, uh, that empire's built. <laughs> we 
we took the month of February off. I don't know if you realized. We were just racking in so much dough from that podcast that we were just like, we're going to step away, go sit on our yachts, drink martinis. Yeah, yeah I didn't notice because Steve was actually over here during that yeah, time off. That's why we took the month off. We stole my co-host. Yeah. yeah, you know, next time you, have, you take another break, you should come down here too, man. All right. I tried. I, I told him, man, get some video on that wedding you guys are going to shoot so I can come with you. Yeah. Well, man, I appreciate you being here and, and talking to me about all this stuff. I wanted to open up some of the stuff that, you know, I feel your guys' podcast is very comedic. I love it. You do learn a lot from it, but, you know, I don't feel like I've you've you really opened don't. up. As you really much. don't. <laughs> I really want you bring up all these things that you're always working on, like the mayoral campaign, the commercial stuff. You talk about it, but it's like in small glimpses. I, I wanted to know more about, you know, that stuff that you're doing, because I feel like people are sure. interested in those things. You know, I'm, I'm interested. I'm trying to do the same thing. And I feel Santa like people, sessions, yeah. you know, any, yeah. t- anytime you want to <laughs> t- talk about that extracurricular stuff. Man, Didn't you say you weren't going to do the Santa sessions anymore? I've, I'm kind of like committed to it at this point because oh, the gosh. guy we used last year bought a $2,000 Santa suit. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I have to yeah. do it. I just have to like reevaluate how we're going to do it to be more profitable. Yeah. Start, but now we'll have pictures to yeah. show. Yeah, so. that. And you can start promoting it ahead, like a lot more ahead of time, I guess, maybe. I, I know, know. I need to figure out the sweet spot as to like, <laughs> when you can do it soon enough like so that people can use the photos yeah. but not too soon where you know it like because some people don't think about doing that stuff till it gets closer to Christmas yeah but it's just a whole thing man it's a whole thing didn't it all come from like a Facebook post or something that someone else wrote <laughs> yeah somebody else wrote like I think it was on F stoppers or like one of those that they did it down in Texas and they made like thirty thousand yeah. dollars or something crazy and so that's the thing I was trying to emulate, and I did not come close to thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't think I think we I don't even know if we broke like three thousand yeah. dollars. But it was enough for you to want to maybe consider it again, though. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. Um, we put a lot less effort in than we were going to, but it was still a, a ton of effort yeah. and money and time. Um, but afterwards we got like a ton of people asking us to do it again. Yeah. And we've talked to, we've run into people that did do it and they're like, Oh, I can't wait, you know, to bring my other kid next year or whatever. And I'm like, okay, you know, maybe this, this is something, you know, we just have to like stick with it and yeah. grow it. And next thing you know, I'm like the Santa photographer. <laughs> I think you're going to own that 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 whole market. <laughs> I just want to somehow be able to incorporate the Jewish population. Oh god. <laughs> uh just Men- ha- tell me photos. Do, yeah, menorah photos or something. Yeah. <laughs> you have your option, uh-huh. sit with Santa or sit with the menorah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, dude, thanks again, man. I appreciate you yeah. taking the time to to talk with me. Yeah. Always, buddy. Yeah. And that's it, everyone. Thanks again for listening to another episode of the Wedding Photo Podcast. If you want to support this podcast, I would appreciate everyone leaving a five-star rating, leaving a review, and just tell your friends about this podcast so we can continue to grow the community of listeners, of photographers and videographers. Um, You know, we're all in this together. We're all just trying to learn off each other. Um, So uh, if you, so all I ask is that you spread the word so we can get uh, more people involved. Um, If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Instagram at Wedding Photo Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at Del Toro Photo, and you can join our Facebook group, All the links are in the show notes below. Remember, if you want to try Narrative Publisher, you can try it for free. Use the link in the show notes so that you can get 15% off using code DELTOROPHOTO. Um, Thanks again, guys, for listening to another episode. I appreciate you all. I love you guys. And uh, we will see you guys on the next one.